I would like to ask to the stage Peter Miller, European CCCBPO about Advisor Elite Deloitte. Peter Miller. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. I, I hear there are 1,100 people. I want to hear what 1,100 people sound like when they're, when they're shouting. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's, uh, that's impressive. OK, now, back in the year 2000, a chap called Reed Hastings jumped on a plane to Dallas, Texas, and went to meet someone called John Antioco. Hastings and Antioco were both CEOs of businesses in the same sector. And Hastings was offering his company to sell to Antioco for $50 million. Antioco de declined the offer. And he commented later that he thought Hastings' company was um, a fringe player and not a major competitive threat to his own. His own company was, was Blockbuster. And uh, you may have guessed it, Reed Hastings' company that was offered to Blockbuster 50 million was Netflix. And I think most of you may know how that story ends. Blockbuster, which at one point was the major player in the video rental sector, with 9,000 stores and about 60,000 employees, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2010. Netflix is now worth about $70 billion or 1,400 times what Blockbuster could have bought it for in the year 2000. So what's the moral of this story? Well, for me, it's a really good example of the power of technology to disrupt, the power of technology to disrupt, disrupt businesses and to make even the most successful business models obsolete in a very short space of time. Blockbuster was a bricks and mortar, an analog business, if you like. You physically went to a store, and you took the video, and you watched it, and you brought it back. When Netflix came in to the market, when they started using streaming technologies, a very digital technology, they offered their customers far better choice, far better convenience, and lower cost. What was not to like about that new model? And Blockbuster, even though they saw it happening, they were so wedded to their business model, their existing business model, which had been so successful, they couldn't react quick enough. So what's the, the moral of the story for you? What's the relevance for you, your business services leaders? Well, let's say you're running a BPO. What happens if one of your competitors suddenly realizes how to apply some new technologies and provide the services you're providing for maybe 30% less cost, 40%, maybe half the cost, at maybe the same or better quality service? How are you going to win against that competitor? I put it to you, you're not. BPO is survival of the fittest. And if you're not fit, i.e. digitally fit, technologically fit, you're not going to win new work. And when your existing clients' contracts expire, which is probably on average two or three years, how are you going to retain your existing clients and customers? Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, that's OK. I'm running a captive. I'm not in the same commercial threat as those BPO providers. Well, what happens when that BPO provider who's worked out how to do this at half the cost knocks on the door of your boss, the CFO, the CIO, the CEO, and says, look, we can run your back office for half the cost, same quality service or maybe better quality service. I suggest to you that even your businesses are massively under threat if you don't understand what's happening in the market right now. Now, I've been in this market for 25 years or so, and here's the amazing thing. Technological change is increasing. I kind of had an assumption when I started that it might be a sort of series of incrementally declining returns with technology. It's not. It's increasing. The pace of change is increasing. And for the reason to that, we have to look back to the 1960s. A chap called Gordon Moore. A chap called Gordon Moore. He was the chairman and co-founder of Intel. And he made an observation, which was that Every 18 months, two years, the speed of computer processing tended to double, and the cost of storage tended to half. Every 18 months to two years, there was an ex exponential growth in processing power. And, and people understand that intellectually. They've heard that, that the Moore's law, as it became known, they've heard that before, and they think, yeah, I get that. 
people don't really get the implications of exponential growth in that space. Let me try and bring it to life. If I was to take 30 steps in a linear fashion, one, two, three, each step one meter, how far would I have gone after 30 steps? If I was heading down there, how far? This is the easy bit, by the way, of the, of the, of the 30 meters, yeah, 30 meters, not even to the end of the hall. Now, if I was to take 30 steps in an exponential fashion, so the first step is a meter, the second step is two meters, I'm going to stop at this point. Third step is four meters. How far would I have gone after those same 30 steps? <clears throat> Outside of the hall, center of woods, maybe Warsaw, maybe Paris. The answer is 26 times round the world with just 30 steps. You can work it out later, get a calculator. I promised you it's 26 times round the world. And the last step was 13 times around the world. Now, that is really scary because that's what's happening. That's the reason why we're seeing this burst of new technologies, the Internet of Things, big data, um, artificial intelligence, drones, self-drive cars, 3D printing, robotics, and so forth. That's why we're seeing this amazing spate of new technologies hitting us. And, and the key word, the key word I would say in shared services, GBS, in, in BPO right now is, is digital. This digital transformation that's happening. And many people say, well, what would digital business services look like? What would it look like if your organization was a master of digital rather than a digital dinosaur? Well, for me, for a digital business services to be called that, you would have to pass the Amazon test, OK? The Amazon test, think about this, I, I get home, Let's say I'm, I'm back in the hotel tonight, and I suddenly think, I really need a tin opener for tomorrow delivered to my home, okay, as you do. You go onto Amazon, you're, you're on your, uh, your, your iPhone, you're on your, your Apple, you're on your, your pad, your iPad, whatever it is, the PC. You go into the software, it's completely intuitive. It's really easy for me to get around. No one, no one ever taught me how to use Amazon. I know how to use it, very intuitive. I can access it anywhere, anytime, any place, fully mobile. The data, the analytics is unbelievable. You can see all the products, all the alternatives. You can read the reviews, look at the prices, look at your previous orders. And finally, it's paperless. You go in, you place the order, you get the product delivered, you have an invoice delivered. There's no paper, it's lights out. Now, think about how that compares to your experience. When you go into the office in your shared service centers, in your BPO organizations, the technology you use, how easy it is to get on, how mobile it is. Is there a user interface that's completely intuitive? Is it fully mobile? Is the data and analytics amazing? And is it paperless and lights out? Do you still have paper in your office? I guarantee none of you can tick those four boxes. I haven't yet met an organization that can claim to be digital business services by passing that Amazon test. But it's something to think about. So when I was told I had 15 minutes, I thought, well, I had about 10 slides, but I reckon I've, I've, I've just got one to show you. And, and this is it. This, for me, is the one slide um, for, a, for a shared services leader, let's say you're running a captive or a BPO, that summarizes all the things I think you should be focusing on right now. Uh, I call it the eight levers of, of back office transformation. And you'll see that there are eight levers and then two things in the middle, which I call the imperatives. You can never take your eye off service orientation. If you take your eye off the customer, you're dead. You really are. You can't take cost out your organization if you lose focus of the customer. And secondly, you need to focus, especially in these days, on value creation, the opportunity to move up the value chain, to do more than take cost out and be a low-cost transaction processor, to look at your ability, for example, companies like GE and Vodafone, within their global business service organizations, they're pioneering the analytics that are being used in the organization for decision making. They're at the forefront of providing those analytics and also at the forefront of providing digital transformation. Just two ways you can really add value as a shared service center in this day and age. But the eight levers, eliminate, simplify, automate, standardize, consolidate, offshore, outsource, continuously improve. As you can tell, I've said that before quite a bit. I've had this slide for a long, long while. For those of you who find that difficult to remember, you will notice there's a very useful acronym, SSCOOC. It's not that useful. 
Um, I'm still working on how to make that a bit easier. But let's go very quickly through some of these. So eliminate. Now, there's a guy called Peter Drucker, a management guru, who once said, there's nothing more inefficient than doing efficiently that which shouldn't be done at all. Tom Peters, another management guru, eliminated half of the words and said, don't do stupid stuff. So if you are producing reports that no one needs and no one reads, stop producing those reports. If you're not sure, stop producing them anyway, see if anyone complains. If you're reconciling bank accounts and you don't need to have all those bank accounts, if you can consolidate your bank accounts, why don't you do that? If you're producing accounts for legal entities that really serve no purpose, they did maybe 20 years ago, they had a tax reason or a strategic reason, see if you can get rid of those legal entities. If you're producing payment runs every day, why not just do it once a week? You know, so see what the drivers of demand are for your work in your shared service organization and see if you can eliminate some of those drivers, reduce demand. Simplify. This is looking at end-to-end -end processes and simplifying the process, re-engineering, business process re-engineering, value stream mapping, all of those good techniques. Now, this is relatively easy when you own the process and it's all, let's say, in one function. It gets more difficult when that process straddles different parts of the organization. So maybe it cuts across finance, HR, IT. Maybe it cuts from the shared service organization to the retained business. Maybe it cuts from the outsourcer to the captive. That's when it gets more difficult. You need to look at the end-to-end -end process. The challenge for shared services is that often you're at the end of the process where all the problems are. If you can't ca collect cash, it might be nothing to do with your cash collection team. It might well be because the sales order people are bonused on getting those sales in their video, in their, in their um, sales center, getting those sales booked. They might not be bonused on the collection of cash. So they have no incentive to put the information in correctly. If you look at the end-to-end -end process, if you redesign it, if you look at the performance metrics and the bonus schemes, you can optimize on an end-to-end -end process basis. So simplification is extremely important. Automation, I've mentioned. The one thing I'll add is, why do you still have people performing transaction processing? Think about it. Should that not be fully automated? If you have a single instance ERP, if you then have some of the process-specific technologies, maybe around order to cash, purchase to pay, hire to retire, some of the providers are out here. Companies like Windshuttle, Trintec, Blackline, Redwood, they offer solutions in those processes. And if you then look at RPA, robotic process automation, to fill in the gaps, RPA is a great tool to fill in the bits that other bits can't. You should get to a stage where you automate transaction processing completely. Now, you may say, well, what about the exceptions? Everyone knows that there are always exceptions. And yes, there are exceptions. But what is your continuous improvement for, if not to root out those exceptions? Continuous improvement should be the relentless pursuit of errors. You find the errors, you find the exceptions, you try and find the cause, and you fix the cause so you don't get those exceptions again. So theoretically, you shouldn't have people doing transaction processing. And if they're still doing exceptions, you should have a continuous improvement program that gets rid of that. If that's the case, the opportunity is to automate transaction processing completely and move to higher value stuff, which is why value creation is an imperative. It's the only way in the long term you're going to justify your existence as you automate more and more of the transactional work. Now, the reality is, again, no one has got anywhere near automating all the transactional work. But as an objective, that should be where you're aiming. Standardization, this is a triple whammy. If you standardize, you reduce cost because it's easier to maintain one system, one policy, one set of policies, one set of processes, much easier uh, and lower cost to do that. It's better for control purposes. It's an easier control environment to, uh, to regulate. And finally, it's much better quality of information because you have one version of the truth, one set of data. No one's arguing with different sets of numbers. I remember working years ago with, um, with Oracle, helping Oracle build their first shared services organization in Europe. And Larry Ellison did what, he, uh, what is known in Oracle as a Larry by telling Wall Street that they would have a single instance of Oracle 11i within 18 months. And uh, no one believed that could be possible. But he did get them towards a single instance pretty, pretty quickly. And he did three things. He said, we're going to have a single instance of Oracle 11i. 
He said, I, Larry Ellison, will sign off on any customizations that people think are necessary, i.e., they won't be necessary. We're going to have vanilla. And thirdly, he said, and we're going to have no Excel in Oracle because Excel is the enemy of standardization. Excel is the enemy of standardization. And as a result of those three policies, right from the very top, senior management commitment, Oracle as an organization have probably centralized more into shared services in any, than any other organization in the finance area. Something like 90% of their finance headcount have been centralized into some form of shared services. Now, not many people have that senior management commitment, but if you can get it, it can be very, very powerful. So consolidate, obviously, people look at shared services. Consolidate is the first thing you would say. Yes, it's about relocating into a common location, better span of control, better economies of scale. And what we see is that organizations tend to do the transactional stuff first. And when they win business permission, they pull in more of the higher value added stuff, like business partnering. And this is where the real challenge is. If you look at finance or HR, the business partners will say, they'll be in the retained organizations, they'll say, my job can't be centralized because I have this day-to-day, face-to-face decision support role. But if you look at what they do, a lot of it is getting information, finding data from various sources, putting into spreadsheets, fiddling it around, analyzing it, reporting on it, and then and only then sitting down and having the strategic decision support meetings. 70, 80% of what they do is often data management. That is a big opportunity for moving into shared services. So consolidation, transaction processing first, but then look to see what you can pull in, especially in that business partnering area. I won't dr dwell on offshoring and outsourcing because I think it's, it's obvious there is still a huge opportunity. Labor arbitrage is still, is still very strong. Places like Poland and India have been very successful initially because of that, but also because of the the quality of the talent here. And also with outsourcing, as well as the economy of scale and the established network of delivery centers outsourcers offer, there is an economy of skill, some of the platforms they're developing, some of the technologies they're developing. And finally, if the other seven levers are all about a step change in cost and productivity, the last one, continuous improvement, helps you every year to improve incrementally. On average, our last survey, in fact, our last two or three surveys every two years we do, has suggested you should be getting 8% continuous improvement from applying that type of methodology. I've run out of time. That's all I can say. I've, I, I'm so glad I was invited here. I've heard great things about this conference the last four or five years. So thank you so much for inviting me, and I look forward to meeting some of you later today and tomorrow. Thank you.